Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, sorry for all of the confusion about the paper assignments. Uh, I had initially put everything onto Blackboard and just set automatic release dates for everything, which has worked in previous semesters, and it's proving not to work during this semester. And so um, I did just open, uh, at the end of last week, your essay, which is due at the end of this week. I also opened on the same day, and I sent an announcement so all of you are well aware of this, um, I just want to reiterate it here, um, that the research paper is also mixed in there. Um, feel free to contact me with questions about the research paper, uh, specifically those of you who are not located in or around Portland. I understand that the requirements for the paper specify that you have to go to the Portland Museum of Art. I'm willing to work with students that uh, either don't want to go to Portland or cannot get to Portland um, about finding a work of art that you can write this research paper on. Um, so yeah, hit me up with questions regarding that stuff. But with regard to today's lecture and our course material, we're going to continue right along full speed ahead uh, with our conversation about our aesthetic developments. This time we are pretty much well after that war, the second, excuse me, the second world war. Um, the war ended obviously in 1945. Um, the artworks that are in this specific chronology are from 1950 to 1965. And that's a really um, pretty remarkable time period in Western culture. Uh, basically what we see after the end of the war is a heightened production of consumer goods. Um, people began to to buy things. This was the rise of what was referred to, what is often referred to as conspicuous consumption, um, which is buying things that one does not necessarily need, um, but that one wants, and also the rise of planned obsolescence, uh, which is the idea that you know every three years or four years, uh, you should purchase a new car. Uh, and this, the, the, the car thing was specific in the 1950s, the, the, this idea that everyone needed to be driving new automobiles and having new things in their homes was a big push in the 1950s. From advertising campaigns to production firms, everybody wanted um, basically the global population to be buying uh, our way out of a series of recessions that hit after the end of the war. Um, it's very similar to the way that the Bush administration uh, during the economic situation in 2008 gave everybody checks that they could then basically spend into the economy. And so this idea that if we're buying things, we are supporting an economy. And th this, there were used to be slogans that, you know, said um, uh, a good American is a buying American. Um, and all these different manner of things. And we still deal with this stuff today. I mean, most Apple products have a planned obsolescence of about three to four years. For any of you that have had an iPod or an iPhone or um, a, an Apple computer, you understand that you know those things tend to wear out, as it were, it, pretty quickly. Um, but uh, as you can see, the slide has changed to some things that deal really specifically with artistic practice because while all of that stuff is going on the artists were also responding so advertising campaigns were being designed to make us want to buy things and then there was there were these various artists and later on I'm going to talk again about uh, Eduardo Palazzi who's one of the first of of these artists um, these artists begin to deal with this idea of conspicuous consumption they begin to deal with the masses of objects that surround the world. Um, oftentimes, when we look back onto this uh, time period, historians argue about whether or not the artists were being critical of uh, of this kind of culture. They began to uh, so that's one camp that artists are saying, you know, we shouldn't be buying things. It's bad to buy things. It um, we're not buying them for the right reasons, X, Y, Z. The other camp is that these objects and this culture was so new that it was fascinating for a lot of artists and they were actually really enthusiastic 
about the development of advertising and buying and con con uh, consumer markets and all that kind of stuff. My perspective is in the center because I think it's, I don't want to guess whether or not these artists were into it or not into it. I think the work speaks for itself as you'll see as we move into it. Um, but I also want to just make sure that you're aware that there are those two sides of this perspective, of these perspectives, that, that you, there's the negative side and the positive side. And somewhere in between, I think, is actually where the reality is. Some artists were against it. Some artists were for it. Other artists were, instead of being for or against it, were just questioning it. And so they were using this new material as a way to just bring up some other questions about how we as a culture relate to the world around us. So a few really brief things, uh, brief ideas about how we got out of a very... Um, abstract, very specific, specifically painting period in American history, which was covered in our last lecture. And so here are some uh, thinkers on the matter. And one of them, the final one is Alan Caprow, whose reading I uh, posted last week. This is just a really simple uh, quote pulled from it. But starting off at the top with Lawrence Alloway, um, here we're to dealing with the idea of the artist's hand, where duplicity and cleanliness break down the emotional connection to gesture. So in the last lecture, I talked to you about you know, how Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, they were making these emotionally rooted artworks, and they were doing so um, by specifying one way of making a mark on a canvas. I refer to it as a specific gesture or a signature gesture. I think those are the two terms that I kept using last lecture. Um, those that kind of artwork became very, very pervasive. A lot of artists throughout the country and throughout the world, as we'll see in this lecture, began to gravitate to that reality. They began to really analyze the gesture. Um, for its emotional content. And so with all of those people moving into that camp, there was obviously going to be another camp of people that would rebel against it. That's, in case you, you haven't picked up, that's kind of the way that the avant-garde in modern and contemporary art works. A lot of people get into one thing, and then people rebel against it. And then people follow the rebels to this new thing, and then people rebel against that. And that's kind of how aesthetics move and how you've seen them move over the course of our time together. So, an important factor in communication in the mass arts is high redundancy. The new role for the fine arts is to be one of the, one of the possible forms of communication in an expanding framework that also includes the mass arts. So Lawrence Alloway here is bringing in to this conversation about this emotional gesture the reality that fine art is only one kind of visual culture that we as a, as a people are consuming. There's only one, it's only one little tiny niche. And advertising and what he refers to as the mass arts, graphic design, cinema, artworks that's actually, that are designed for a wider audience, those things have to take account as well. And so as we Basically, Alloway is saying we need to not just focus all of our attention on this gestural um, emotionality. We need to actually encompass all of our artistic production, all of our visual cultural production, in a much more um, all-encompassing perspective on, on what we're making. And what this does is it allows artists to begin to use things, elements, from the, these quote-unquote mass arts and bring them into the fine art realm. So Alloway is really the first step. The first step is acknowledging that yes, fine art has one point in our culture, but there's all these other things that we look at. And so artists respond to this by using all of the things that we're looking at in fine art practice. And so it kind of shifts a little bit. Um, one of the other things that changes was, uh, changes is the imagery. So, uh, as I was saying just a second ago, that artists began to use these different th 
um, elements from the quote unquote mass arts in their fine art practice. For that, we have a special term, it's called appropriation. And appropriation in this regard, you might have heard the term as like an appropriations committee, um, is often a, a term that comes up in news feeds because appropriations committee decides who can spend money in government. Appropriation in art practice is very different. Uh, when you appropriate something, you basically take it and you put it and make it yours. And so we've seen appropriation actually before in this course. Collage is appropriation. Every single collage that I've shown you has been appropriated material, where the artist has taken objects out of news magazines, popular magazines, um, cartoons, and put them, cut them out and actually place them onto a sheet of paper or a canvas to make a collage. They've appropriated them. And that's what happens with, um, with the imagery. And you'll see that much more specifically at the, near the end of this section of the lecture. And then when we get into the American pop art, it, it's going to be much clearer. And the last thing that changes is the spaces of sculpture. And so what Alan Caprow says, um, but what I believe is clearly discernible is the entire work, uh, is the entire, yeah, work comes out at us. <clears throat> we are participants rather than observers, right into the room. That's going to be a big change. The way that artists interact with their audience is going to drastically change in these 15 years. No longer are we going to just have flat objects that rest on the wall. They're, um, because of the legacy of groups like the Dadaists, we're going to start to see much more audience participation. And that also stems from the understanding that artists have that the material that they're appropriating comes from the audience's real world. And so basically what we see here is the, the artists are no longer in their studio hashing out emotional realities. What they're doing is they're going out into the world and engaging with the world. And that's why this lecture is, was subtitled art in our world, uh, involving our world, um, because that's what these artists are actively doing. Now one thing I forgot to mention with regard to the Lawrence Alloway quote was that we're going to start seeing a high degree of polish on a lot of these works. That's going to come more specifically in the American chronology, the, which is going to be the latter half of today's lecture. And so, um, you know, duplicity and cleanliness break down emotional, the emotional connection to the gesture. So, in addition to kind of critiquing the um, this emotional signature gesture that we talked about last week, artists also see that as a, a limiting um, method for making work. And so, instead of having them be these like paint-covered heroes chain-smoking in their artist studios in New York City. We have artists that are existing all over the, the world that are taking a much cleaner, much more austere approach. And what they're doing there is they're actually appropriating me not necessarily the imagery of advertising, but that slick polish. Because this is also the time period that we see the rise of the glossy magazine. So all of these things, basically a huge change in our culture happened between the end of the war and the early 1950s. And what we're going to see in these 15 years is that artistic practice also goes through this massive overhaul and changes to suit a new and changing culture. And this is something that has happened previously in our conversation. So kind of well-worn territory. The, the, the path that the avant-garde takes, the following of the rebel that I just talked about, is something that occurs unanimously in modern and contemporary art. All right, so we're going to start off with Europe. Now, one thing to... I guess the easiest way for me to explain why I'm starting off with a painting that looks like this, specifically after I just talked about all of that stuff of, um, you know, the emotional gesture is fading away. Well, before it can fully fade away, the spread of that emotional, uh, the emotionality is the word I'll keep using, 
Um, the spread of that emotionality or that emotional disposition to making works starts in New York and then moves to Europe and then farther moves to Japan. But as the art moves from, the, from New York uh, going slowly east, it's, it subtly changes. And so the chronology for Europe and also the chronology for Japan, which we're going to get at uh, in just a second, deal a lot with these artists outside of New York processing the legacy or the importance or the, um, the ideas put forth by the New York painters that we talked about last week. And so Nicholas de Stijl here figures by the sea. It's a figurative work. So he's imaging something that exists in our world, which is different than, say, a Willem de Kooning or a Jackson Pollock, like we showed last week. But he's using a painting style that's very similar to, say, the lessons of Hans Hoffmann or also the lessons of Willem de Kooning. Um, Nicholas de Stijl is one of three artists that exists um, in Copenhagen, Brussels, and Amsterdam. And when you string those city names together, you get a group of artists that's loosely referred to as Cobra. You'll see that name um, periodically in, in some textbooks. I believe Gompertz mentions the name in our textbook, so that's there. Um, and for those of you who want to know what how this is actually something by the sea, this is a horizon line. This whole orange area here is water. And then this is a figure. And this, I think, is also a figure. Hans Hartum uh, is a German painter. And he it seems really a lot like the paintings I showed you last week, right? It looks a little bit like a Pierre Solage painting. It looks a little bit like a Franz Klein painting. Um, but the one thing that's different here is that Hartung is using a stain as opposed to, um, or he's not using a stain. He is using oil paint similarly to the way a stain would operate in that it would fade into the material that it's put onto. And so this goes, this is kind of that, the meeting of the gesture with the polish. So we have this gesture. It looks very much like an artist actively made these works. But when you are in the presence of these objects, they're very clean, they're very orderly, and they're very specific, which is something that's a little bit different than what we saw in uh, New York. Now at this point, Jackson Pollock is still alive. Willem de Kooning is still... It, charting his meteoric rise to the top of the art world, American abstract painting is still really prevalent, and we have not seen a huge watershed, the huge watershed moment of the switch from the abstract gesture into this idea that I'm referring to as cool realness. It's also referred to as pop art, but pop art is really specific to the United States. Now, Georges Mathieu presents a really interesting case. He is a French artist, as the last name indicates, um, and he took hook, line, and sinker the idea of the action painter that was put forth by Harold Rosenberg to heart. So he sees himself as this heroic action painter, and he makes works that look like this. Now, I'm going to return to Mathieu in just a moment, but I want to keep going, but I wanted to introduce this work to you. It's an early work. It's from 1954. So this is right around the time that he's getting into this m head space of being uh, an abstract expressionist painter or an action painter, more specifically. Pierre Alchinsky is another member of the Cobra group. Uh, and here is his tribute to Enzor. Um, and so what we have here is Alchinsky is actually appropriating the style of painting, the palette, and also the idea from art history. And so before artists really get into appropriating from magazines heavily and appropriating from cinema and the moving image and tel television specifically, we have artists that begin to appropriate from their own vocabulary, their own locus, locusts of knowledge or loci of knowledge, 
And so Alchinsky, Enzer is a really famous painter from Northern Europe who we didn't talk about during the Impressionist period because we didn't have enough time. Um, he's this kind of seminal Belgian artist and Alchinsky, being a European painter, knows Enzer's work, uh, really likes his work, and so he creates this tribute to him. Um, and it's loosely figurative. I say loosely because I've read lots of things about this painting that say that there's figures in there. I see a lot of anthropomorphic shapes or shapes that look like humans, but um, I don't necessarily see it as specifically figurative. Carol Ar Arpel is uh, the last, well, one of the, 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 the last of the Cobra artists that we're going to talk about. Um, and here we have a crying crocodile. Here's the crocodile's face. Here's some tears. Paying, trying to catch the sun. And so this, these gestures here are that crocodile kind of clapping his hands, trying to catch the sun while he's crying. There's a lot of kind of goofy mysticism involved in this painting. Um, I think it's really nicely painted. Like the way he handles the pigment is really interesting. But um, I also think it's a little bit adorable that there's this like this idea of a crying crocodile. I'm sure there's something about environmentalism here, but that's for another class. All right. So I told you that I was going to return to Georges Mathieu. Here is First Avenue from 1957 by him. Now, Mathieu is this quintessential example for the change from the, the action painting in New York into a much more pop um, mode or uh, structure. And the specific switch there is that Mathieu likens himself to a performer in a lot of cases. He makes works live in a lot of cases. And so where Rosenberg, in his essay on the American action painter, sets up this idea that inside the artist's studio, and more specifically inside the artist's head and the arena of the canvas, the artist is at work. Mathieu takes all of that stuff out of the, the, this kind of private space of the studio or the mind and brings it into a much more public arena. And for works like this, you know, well, here really quickly is um, this is a, this goofy picture of Mathieu covered in red paint. Um, how a person wearing all white can get paint really specifically on their face and not on the collar of their shirt is proof to me that this is that he's really into the idea of performing as a painter. Like he likes the that emotional and social category. And so um, I think it's kind of goofy, but you know, that's just me. Um, and then uh, what we have on the other side is this idea that, um, oh, it's him performing. So that, that's him performing. He like does this weird, these like goofy little dances. Sometimes he would even wear uh, chain mail and an and epe or a, a fencing foil and uh, attack the canvas that way. So he was really into this idea of being the, the artist as performer, but he also makes really interesting works like the splatter that occurs on this canvas, this white splatter here, is really kind of nuts. Like the, the, the fact that he was able to focus that that moment of chaos so specifically so that it mimics uh, this arc here and then the splatters go out. It's just, it's a, a pretty interesting painting that he put together. Um, but the painting alone is not just the thing, you know, in the same way that we now look at Jackson Pollock's paintings and see all those images of him painting over them. Um, Mathieu didn't wait for history to attach those pictures to his work. He did it himself. So he was really adamant about performing in front of everything. So, um, Antoni Tapie, Gran Pintura, uh, great painting from 1958, oil with sand on canvas. And so, 
you know, at the end of the war, when we talked about European painters like, say, um, uh, Jean de Buffet and uh, Jean Fautrier, we talked a lot about how they were processing the, the kind of the grit of the war because they were living in the war, uh, in the, the the battlefield of the war. Whereas Americans had this uh, disassociation from the battlefield. Yes, we had Pearl Harbor. I don't want to diminish the reality of that being a battlefield, but um, most Americans didn't actually have to have some sort of asali uh, refugee situation. The Europeans did, and so the Europeans had a much different relationship to the landscape. And so Tapier was really interested in putting his landscape actually into the painting. And so he includes sand in this very cubist way, just kind of subtly adding it in there to add a little bit of texture. And that texture brings up the conversation about uh, the, the actual environment that the painting is made within. It's not just this kind of detached thing. It, in, uh, it's much more involved. Now, in Paris, we have this group that pops up called um, Nouveau Realisme. And Nouveau Realisme is a, uh, um, is a group that developed at the exact same time as pop art actually developed a little bit beforehand and I think that for for I, I always bring it up first because it's the grittier one of the two pop immediately is really polished um, Nouveau Realisme it it kind of presents a go-between with this kind of work and what's going to come next <clears throat> so with this kind of work as I was talking about and it actually came up a little bit with the uh, Bori painting that I showed you last week that was all found material um, the Nouveau Realismas are very interested in presenting what the word means, new realism. So they are going into the world and bringing the real world into their artistic practice. A good example of this is Christo, who's a French artist. Uh, th these wrapped oil barrels are from 1958. At the end of the war, Paris just happen to have a lot of these oil drums kind of all over the place. And in American movies, we always see them in, like, uh, places where a lot of uh, homeless people are, are living and they're lighting fires in them and all this kind of stuff. Well, the same was that was the same reality that was existing in Europe. And so Christo wanted to make some sort of commentary of, on the sheer volume of these oil barrels around Paris. And so he brought a few of them into a gallery, and he wrapped certain ones um, in this paper or plastic. So this one's wrapped, 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 wrapped. All the other ones are obviously unwrapped. And the wrapping for Christo is a way for him. It's a very simple gesture that he can use to bring art, quote unquote, into these objects. By changing them subtly, you make them into art. It's very Duchampian. It's kind of the legacy uh, that is going to come out around him and his art very soon. Um, Duchamp, by 1958, is nearing the end of his life, and we're about to, or Duchamp has actually already passed away, but we're about to see a massive publication of his work. And so it's not surprising that a lot of these artists deal really specifically with this legacy, quote-unquote, of Marcel Duchamp. Now, Yves Klein um, is the gentleman who was in the photograph that I showed you under the title of Nouveau Realisme, who's leaping off of the building. Um, for one of his most important art projects, he made a work that's referred to as La Vide, which means the void, translates directly into the void. And what he did was he went into this space uh, gallery Iris Clerk, um, and he painted the entire space white. He cleared everything out of the space, and he held an opening reception in the space with absolutely nothing. There was no art in the in the space. What he was doing with the work was actually creating a void that was the artwork. 
So the emptiness of the gallery was the art for Klein. Having people come into that empty space and engage with that emptiness was the work. And so where Christo is bringing in all of this stuff, Klein is saying, well, what happens if we have a, a, a space where there's nothing? But Klein also has a little bit of a sense of humor, and so really quickly I'll tell you an anecdote about the opening reception. He is really, really obsessed with the color blue um, in the same way that, like, our Jay-Z has, like, a Jay-Z blue. He named his daughter blue. Blue, blue, blue. He's really into blue. Yves Klein did it first. Um, Yves Klein had also a, a, an Yves Klein blue. It's very radiant blue. Um, and he found that blue kind of had mystical qualities, or he wanted to find that blue had mystical qualities. And so he served blue martinis at this opening. But the chemicals in the martini, the chemicals that made the martini blue, actually had an, another effect on the viewers. When those viewers would go home, and they would go to the bathroom to relieve themselves after having a few too many of these cocktails, they would be surprised to find that what was coming out of their body was also blue. So they were, they were basically peeing blue. Um, and this was part of the concept of Klein's practice here. He wanted them to have this experience of being in a space that was seemingly empty, but then when they left, their body actually had a very physical memory of having been in that space, in that they were going to the bathroom and peeing blue. Here's another photograph of the inside of the space. I'm showing you two photographs that are of empty spaces. These are not, he, Klein is not a photographer. The artwork is not these photographs. The artwork is the empty space. Uh, we saw the work by, by John de Buffet before, and um, here he is again. And in the same way as uh, Antoni Tappi and um, Mr. Brewery from last week, Debuffet is really interested in picking up some of the garbage that's around him and turning it into an artwork. And for this work, Soul of the Underground, he goes around the streets of Paris and he picks up all of the various aluminum foil that he finds. He brings it back to his studio, he affixes it to a canvas, he adds a very, very, very little bit of paint to certain aspects of it, and then puts it on a wall and calls it done. This is his portrait of Paris, but it's the Paris that no one's paying attention to at this time. It's the Paris that is the, the detritus on the streets. We are, at this point, a long way away from the end of the war, so it's not necessarily that he's talking about the the refuse from the war, it's more the refuse from consumerism. I imagine that a lot of these foils would have been the covers for candy wrappers, they would have been um, various kinds of things that were recently purchased and then the wrapping of it was thrown on the ground. So this is, we're, we're moving out of post-war uh, thinking or immediate, like a responsive artistic practice and into uh, something that's responding more specifically to consumerism. In 1960, another artist did another work at the Iris uh, Clerk Gallery, or Gallery Iris Clerk, and Armand responded to Yves Klein's project with Le Plain, which means full up. And he went through the streets of Paris, similar to Debuffet, and he picked up everything that he could find and dragged it into the gallery space. And so he put on view nothing but the garbage around Paris. So that's the view from outside. I love this image of this man looking in. It looks like it almost could be Armand bringing more stuff. I'm not actually certain if it is or if it is not, but I do like the fact that he's staring at this window of the gallery that's full up of stuff. Um, here is a sardine can that was used as the invitation to the exhibition. And this other image is Iris Clerk, the gallerist from, obviously, Gallery Iris Clerk, uh, in the space with Armand's Le Plain. So she's sitting on all of this detritus, trying to make uh, sense of her day. 
Armand did have one of the last vestiges of a response to the war, uh, and it came in the shape of Home Sweet Home. There's a few of these. This is uh, the first iteration of it. And he went around and collected all of the gas masks that were initially put on the market for the uh, during the, the Second World War, but then they kind of lingered around as Cold War politics kept people on edge. No one really knew if another war was going to come up, and so people were kind of prepared for anything. And one of the things that they were prepared for was the idea of gas warfare. And so a lot of people actually had gas masks in their homes. And so what Armand did, similar to what he did in the full gallery space, as he collected these objects, put them in one kind of shallow shadow box, and allowed viewers to kind of look at them and think about the reality of the world that they live in. So this is very much about a broader emotional reality. And in comparison to, say, someone like uh, Lee Krasner, or Willem de Kooning, or Jackson Pollock, those, all those paintings were specifically about their interior dialogue. Armand is very much about having a conversation with the world outside of the studio. Here's another Yves Klein work. Um, now, Alan Caprow, in that quote that I read, brought up the idea that the, the way that artists were using space was changing, but they were also changing the way that they used the body. And so Eve Klein actually inked a variety of female models and then pressed them onto the page in a public performance um, called Le Su or <coughs> I'm horrible, Mondokan, Mondokane Shroud, that's what it's called. Um, and that's the Eve Klein blue, so. Um, one of the artists that was responding directly to the advertising in the streets of Paris was Raymond Haynes. Um, and here he, what he did was the opposite of a collage. And so he and the artist, I'm going to show you in just a second, created something called decollage, where they would actually go around, cut out the entirety of a billboard. Like, when, so basically they are cutting out a bunch of layers of previous ads. They were taking those back to their studio and then carefully ripping them away uh, to reveal things underneath. Now, Haynes would always title the work something that appeared in the object. And so here we have um, For Peace, Democracy, and Social Progress. Uh, it's a poster for um, you know, a, a, a march, a conversation, a protest. And so, um, yeah, he's responding with the aesthetics of it, but he's he's changing it. You know, he's not saying that. You know, I I really like think that this um, this social demonstration is important, so I'm going to make an artwork about it. It's more that he's responding to the fact that there are these advertisements for it. Jacques Villiglay, uh, the jazz man, and he does almost the exact same thing as Raymond Haynes. Uh, where he goes around, cuts out the entirety, all of these l various layers of advertising, and then alters them in his studio. And they're doing this specifically for aesthetic reasons. They want them to look a certain way. They want them to look a little messy, a little gross, but um, also a little bit like advertising. At a certain point, uh, Christo teams up with a female artist named Jean-Claude, and they begin to make work that's very similar to uh, the work that he was doing on his own. And in this work, they, you know, on, in one street in Paris, they took all of these oil barrels that two years prior Christo was wrapping, and they blocked an entire street with them. And so you're an average Par Parisian, you're walking to work, you make that turn onto Rue Visconti because it's a shortcut for you and all of a sudden you're confronted with all of this garbage that's around you. So the Europeans are really dealing specifically with the amount of trash that's around. Um, that's kind of the mainstay of the European art at this time. Um, and so here's one example of this. This also relates to the Caprao quote that I put out there. So this is sculpture in, in a different space. 
It's not sculpture in a gallery or in a museum. It's sculpture in the public sphere. All right. So that's sculpture in the public sphere. That's artists dealing with garbage and advertising and advertising garbage. Um, and then we get to Japan. And so Japan, we're going to pick right back up with the direct influence from at the idea of action painting. But it's important to understand that, you know, Jackson Pollock was doing those heroic drips in a studio alone. But in Paris, Georges Mathieu was doing them in public, and he was using a, a sharp object at times to kind of quote-unquote attack the painting. It's the influence of Mathieu that shows up more in Japan. So because it, of this like Western trajectory of influence, Pollock's work gets to Japan, but Pollock doesn't ever get to Japan. Mathieu's work gets to Japan, but so does he. And so he's able to go over there and actually teach them, lecture, talk about all of this stuff, um, and inspire young Japanese artists. And they're inspired not only by the, the finished objects of Mathieu and of Pollock, they're also really inspired by the performance of it all. Um, and this thing down at the bottom, Wakan Yosai, uh, is a slogan that comes up a lot in Japanese art at this time. It's refer it translates directly to Japanese spirit, Western knowledge. And what that means is that these Japanese artists are learning from the West, but they're interpreting it in a very Japanese way. Now, the main group of artists that I'm going to talk about here are referred to as the Gutai group. And gutai is a Japanese word that means tangible, concrete, it is not theoretical, and is not abstract. And so you're going to see these people making paintings that seem gestural, but the gesture is the thing that is the work. It's not the, the painting is just the after effect, in the same way that the George Mathieu painting is the after effect of an action that happens. And so, you know. It's, hang with me for just a second. So, the art in the United States of Jackson Pollock was the finished painting. In Paris with George Mathieu, it was the painting and the performance. And by the time we get to Japan, it's really specifically the, the performance and the paintings come secondary. As the Gutai group is getting its legs in 1954, they publish a manifesto similar to other earlier European groups like the Futurists. Uh, we have Toshia Yoshida giving us Aka, which is uh, Japanese for red. And in this work, what uh, Yoshida has done is actually penetrated the canvas and instead of leaving that hole in it like Lucio Fontana and allowing this conversation to be about um, you know, the, the vacancy of space behind it, all of this, like, really esoteric painting theory stuff. What Yoshida was interested in doing was showing the fact that that hole leads to the back of the painting, and then if I put another hole in there, I can just loop this rope through and have a very, very concrete thing. So it's not about asking questions, it's about giving facts. So this is red and that red has a knot in it. Shozo Shimamoto also wore away holes in his canvas, but he did this with the physical action of rubbing the paintings or sanding the paintings. And so he affected these holes in the canvas. And it was it's less about what Fontana was trying to do with creating that idea of this vacancy that goes on for eternity behind the space, and is much more about showcasing the fact that this was an artist who is physically at work on the surface of this canvas. They are physically manipulating and basically ruining the materials that are here. Perhaps the most direct example of this, it comes from Sabora Murakami, who at the second installment of a group show by Gutai presented this work called At One Moment Opening Six Holes. And what you see is that the last 
part of this. So this is the sixth hole that Shima, uh, excuse me, that Murakami is literally throwing himself through. Here's another picture of it. The thing with this that a lot of people they look at this and they um, they don't respond to it. They like this. They they see this guy doing this action and they just kind of sit there. Um, I've seen this presented in public lectures, but I've also lectured about it in classrooms with students. And it blows my mind that more people don't find this really funny. I mean, you can, like, if you're standing in a room and all of a sudden you see this this very, like, well put together Japanese man throwing himself through six uh, sheets of paper that resemble canvases, why wouldn't you laugh? It's really kind of funny. I mean, sure, there's a lot of um, very heady, esoteric stuff that, that's going on here, but ultimately, it is about the physical action. And if, and if, like, for me, if I saw this, I would start laughing because the physical action has a certain air of comedy to it. And that's not necessarily a mark against the work. So, like, don't feel bashful about showing how you actually want to interact with these works. Like, if you want to laugh at this, which I hope some of you are doing on your home computers, go for it, because it is hilarious to see this man doing this thing. Obviously, I've not seen him do this. He's no longer alive. Um, uh, but, you know, I've seen a lot of images of it, and all of them look really, really quite funny. Kazuo Shiraga um, at, m painted with his feet. And so we have all these paintings that exist as the after effect of him actually just putting paint on the on the on the floor and using his feet to wiggle it around. And this is one of those those canvases. And uh, if you look closely, you can see right over here. Oops. There we go. Right here is. Uh, Shiraga's foot. So, so that's Japan. That before was Europe, and now we're going to go into the United States. So, while all of the European nations and Japan were developing this specific kind of painting style, which is a weird conversation that's born out of the Harold Rosenberg perspective on action painting, artists in the United States were doing something very different. And that's what we're going to get into right now. All right. Los Estados Unidos. Let's just get right into it. So one of the big influences on um, pop art in the United States was Britain's independent group. And that group, uh, this is an image from a big show they did at Whitechapel Gallery in 1955. Um, but that group had this guy as part of its founding members. Um, so when we talked about this work, I talked to you specifically about how you can read it for all the various cultural cues that Palazzi brings to, to light here. But one thing I didn't really talk that much about was the inclusion of the, the onomatopoeia pop. That pop is actually the where we get the term pop art from. It was Palazzi's influence that gave us the, the, the traction, um, or that's, let, let me say it this way, that's the first time that we see the word pop in fine art, and so it might not be the where we get the word from, but it's the oldest example of it. Uh, and I talked a lot about this last time, so I'm not going to go over it that much, but this was really, really influential. This was also influential, uh, and so in 1955, collage artists, or appropriation artist uh, Richard Hamilton made an advertisement for an exhibition that exhibition that I just mentioned at White Chapel in London of the independent group this was that advertisement the advertisement was a collage that was made of other advertisements and so we have all of these other symbols that are pulled from popular culture put on view to convey or present a conversation about popular culture. And even the title, just what is it that makes today's homes so different, so appealing? And so what Hamilton has done in this collage is he's set up 
this this idea of today's homes. So the, here we have what looks to be a, an apartment or at least a living room of a home that is filled with all of the newest things that someone can buy in 1955. We have a large poster on the wall referencing the kind of the, the older culture, um, also a small painting. But then we have a television set, uh, a pre-cooked canned ham. These two people who occupy the space. There's actually a third person in the space and she's the cleaning lady at the top of the stairs. But the two black and white figures here who are scantily clad present this other perspective that, you know, in addition to having all of these new things, you as the homeowner or you as the contemporary person need to also present yourself as being physically desirable. And they and so Hamilton does this in these really cheeky ways of having uh, this woman um, who's wearing only a set of pasties uh, presenting her body to you and then we have this muscle man uh, holding very um, suggestively a large lollipop over the over his groin um, we have on the floor here there's two really interesting things I want to point out before moving on on the floor is uh, a carpet quote unquote but it's actually an image of an abstract painting and so Hamilton is saying, you know, there's been so much abstract painting since 1945 to now that it's basically just design. It's just, like, what's the point of it? It's just like buying a new carpet. Um, and so in the critique of the paintings of the previous generation, Hamilton is um, trying to present something that's new and different. Now on the ceiling we have a picture of the moon and this idea that you know that's that that's the proximity of this place. You live in these high-rise buildings, or, and or you have this great access to um, the wonders of the natural world. It's a really complex collage that uh, you can spend a lot of time reading. And if you decide to spend that time reading, I would recommend um, using the format that we talked about with the. Palazzi image last week. Now in 1955, the same year as the independent groups show, two young artists in New York City began responding very combatively against American painting of the day. Robert Rauschenberg, who I talked to you last week uh, about his white paintings, began to make works that were very critical of gestural abstraction. The idea in a work like this, Bed, <clears throat> from 1955, is that the painter in the United States at this time is conveying, is, is so wrapped up in his work that there's even paint on his bed. It's so much a part of his life, how he presents himself to the world, that abstraction and gesture and drips are, are everywhere. They're on his clothes, they're on his hands. I mean, think of that image of Mathieu where it was like all over his face. Rob Rauschenberg's saying, like, that's not real. These people have clean studios. These people have c clean lives. And so he created this object, actually using a friend's quilt to do so, and a pillow, and he made these drips on what is designed to look like an actual bed. But before he did that, in 1953, after completing his time in uh, Black Mountain College, he took a risk. He went to Willem de Kooning's studio, he knocked on his door, and he presented de Kooning with a bottle of whiskey and asked if he could uh, do something really bizarre. Rauschenberg was trying to figure out, he was in the process still of making those white paintings and he wanted to make a few drawings that were also white. And for Rauschenberg, white meant devoid of information. Not necessarily clean, but polished. And so he went to Rauschenberg's studio, or de Kooning's studio, and he asked if he could take one of de Kooning's drawings and erase it. And that's exactly what he did. And uh, the story is really kind of wonderful. Um, I posted the link in the learning module, so it's a four minute video. You should watch that, and I'll let uh, Rauschenberg do the talking. At the same time, in the same studio, Rauschenberg's friend, Jasper Johns, was making works 
that were also very critical of the abstraction of the day. Johns was very interested in the idea that these paintings had become, uh, people saw in abstraction emotional reality. And so what Johns was really cur was interested in was like, what do other things that we look at mean? And is there anything in our culture that it has so much meaning that it's hard to look at it in any other way? And he landed on this one, the American flag. And so he began making a series of American flag paintings that are, um, you can see here the detail. Um, so what he's done is he has covered a canvas with newspaper and then he uses a wax like material called encaustic which is basically a binder for oil uh, oil paints um, and he paints with that but the thing with the encaustic what makes it so sp specific here is that it leaves all of this brushy information on the surface of the canvas so like all of this stuff here actually is these bump marks so it looks like this flag is quote unquote gesturally painted but it's much more uh, methodical than that and so John's is um, he's playing with a, a lot of different ways that we perceive this work <clears throat> in 1957 um, Rauschenberg began experimenting with the idea of duplicating things and so he made two identical paintings. One is called Factum One, the other Factum Two. One hangs in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and one hangs in the collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, obviously in San Francisco. I've had the privilege of seeing these two paintings hanging side by side, and I can say that um, in person, they, rep they look a lot more identical than um, than they do in these two images. I tried very hard to find matching images, but um, there aren't really any that I could uh, properly or adequately put in today's lecture, so sorry there. But what we have around this canvas are all of these, m these ideas toward abstract painting. So we have this like quick brush mark that's dripping. We've got another one here, another one here, another one here. Um, but then we also have references to popular culture with uh, you know, an image of the, the seating president, uh, a calendar, a tree, which is actually a reference to Claude Monet, but I'm not going to go into that, and then a picture of New York City, or some New York City buildings. And then he did the exact same thing on this other one, Factum 2, same, same setup. And so what he's saying here, he's commenting again on the redundancy of this kind of um, picture making. There are so many abstract paintings that exist in the world by 1957 that look very similar that Rauschenberg is bringing all of uh, like little bits of those similarity to light to say like maybe we're done with this. Maybe it's time to find something else. And in this work he's presenting what that something else could be and that's the inclusion of popular culture bringing the popular culture into work to expand it the way that Alloway talks about, to expand the what's included in fine art practice to include the mass art. Um, John continues forward with this project about the American flag and how many presentations of it you can have. Basically what he wants is a person to stand in front of this and be totally emotionally unmoved or at least unmoved artistically. He wants them to see this as a cultural icon that has a very specific meaning, but not one that is necessarily translatable into fine art practice. And I can tell you, after seeing a lot of these things in person and overhearing what people say in those gallery spaces, um, a lot of it works. A lot of people look at these, as I'm sure some of you have done as well, and say, I don't get it. He just made a picture of a flag. That's the point. All right, now, I've referred to this lecture as cool realness because obviously the realness is the incorporation of these mass arts or the real 
the, the real day-to-day -day existence of, of people. But I refer to it as cool um, because there is this very placid temperament to the presentation in pop art. Jackson Pollock was very boisterous. He, I, I put him in the camp referred to as hot. So he's like in a studio, might be a little drunk, he's just active, he's like feisty and making these things in this, in this really frenetic moment. But on the opposite side we have uh, Andy Warhol who presents very cool objects. He, the, his emotional disposition while making these isn't present necessarily in them. They're very cold, they're very aloof, they're very distant. That's on purpose. That's the backlash. Um, I can say that Andy Warhol was starting to get some attention during the kind of the end of the 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 hot scene in Lower Manhattan, and they didn't like him. Those painters, they thought that he was weird. They thought that he um, was awkward. They also had some problems with the fact that he was gay or perceptively gay, and so this very macho group of very emotional, hot-headed hot men um, pushed Warhol and a lot of his other friends out of uh, the conversation. And they did the same thing with Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg. Um, Johns is not a gay artist, but Rauschenberg it was. He's now dead. Roy Lichtenstein, um, I, I certainly don't want all of you to think that the pop artists are all gay and the abstract artists are all straight, because that's not the case. Um, so we're no longer going to, I'm not going to bring any of that information up because it's not really that relevant. Their work is their work. Um, Roy Lichtenstein pulls directly from source material in popular culture, but instead of being the kind of standard collage practice that we've seen before, what he does is he takes these things and then repaints them on a larger scale. So this is actually an oil painting, but it is pulled from an image from a magazine that Lichtenstein purchased. And it's very aptly titled Girl with Ball because that's what it is an image of. Alan Caprow exploring what I brought up previously this idea of expanded sculpture or sculpture in an expanded field. Um, he engages with the real the real experience of people. And so he filled this yard with tires and then had people wander through it. And um, that's a picture of him and I believe that's his son standing behind him um, looking up at the camera. And so the, you know, this is I think a little bit of a conversation with the European artists of the day, like Jean um, Armand, obviously comes to mind. You know, Armand filled a gallery with trash. A year later, Caprao fills a space with tires, um, and both of them allow people to kind of walk through the detritus that is not often collected in such a grand scheme. Klaus Oldenburg in 1961 made a project that is called the store and uh, this is an advertisement for the store and this is an image of Oldenburg in the store and this is an image of the pastry case at that store so he opened what was referred to as the store in a retail location in lower Manhattan in the Lower East Side he then put things on view in that space that were for sale that looked like objects that you could buy at other stores. And so this pastry case is filled with a bunch of fake pastry goods. There's also two ice cream sundaes, three ice cream sundaes if you count the banana split. Strawberry shortcake, blueberry pie, that cake, I don't, I think it's a candy apple and I have no idea what that long thing is. Maybe that's like a coffee cake. Um, so they're made out of, of various materials. Some of them are paper mache, some of them are made from sturdier materials, some of them are actually, like these metal containers are actually metal. Um, let's go back to look at what else we have here. 
Um, you can see there's in this very back there's a wedding dress that has a scary veil with eyes on it. Uh, Oldenburg is here holding a piece of cake. Um, there's some clothes, pulling items around. Um, this was Oldenburg's thing. In his, for his critique of consumer culture, he wanted to make false objects that people could still buy. Um, so it's kind of a, he, he's playing with both, with, with the whole idea of buying things, but he's also um, baiting people and getting them to purchase things that they can't use under the auspices that they are quote unquote art. I think they're art. I'm putting them in quotes just because some people at that day didn't really think they were. Leon Golub um, takes a cue really specifically from Jean Fautrier. He's a painter that deserves a shout out and so I want to put him in there. Um, there's not really much to, to talk about with this work other than, you know, here he is. He's a good painter. He deals with the outside world and brings it into his work. Um, he's a very politically aligned artist, and uh, so this artwork is often read as being very political in the same way that Jean Fautrier's Tête d'Otage, or head, head of a Hostage, is also political. But, in a more lighthearted manner, Wayne Thibault, let's say you pronounce that last name, it's not Thibault, it's Thibault, make this work, Pies, Pies, Pies. Now, Thibault is really interested in painting. He really, really, really likes painting. And he likes painting very regimented, structured paintings. And this is one of them. So what we're going to see develop next is a, a kind of abstraction that's very hard-edged, um, color fields and the like. Thibault is going to get us there by taking us from a critique of purchasing things or buying culture, consumerism, into a much more artistic, heady, esoteric conversation. He pretty ex much exclusively painted desserts in rows. It's kind of a feat. In 1962, on the other side of the country, all these artists I've talked to you about have been primarily based in New York City. But in L.A. at the Ferris Gallery, Andy Warhol in 1962 presented his first series of artistic objects. Before this show, what Warhol was doing was working in advertising. He was actually in those offices. He was drawing things that would turn into ad campaigns. He was setting up window displays that would, that would help market objects. But at a certain point, he wanted to not do that anymore, and he wanted to make fine artwork. But he needed to figure out how. And at one point, as the story goes, he was trying to figure out something to paint. And someone said, paint what you, paint what you know, kind of thing. And he was like, well, every day I have a can of Campbell's soup. And so I'm going to make a painting of this can of Campbell's soup. And he made one. And then he realized an easier way to do it was to make uh, or an easier way to have the same conversation was to make a painting of all of the different s kinds of soup that Campbell's offers. And he put them, he made these paintings, he put them all on view at the same time, and they were purchased at, in one fell swoop by one person. Um, actually, that's a lie. A few of them were purchased by other people, but when somebody came in and bought the majority of them, they then went and purchased the other works from those collections. Um, including the actor Dennis Hopper, who before he was a principal actor, he was also a photographer. He purchased one of these things and then subsequently sold it to the collector that subsequently bequeathed it to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which is where occasionally you can see all of these things on view. But Warhol wasn't done with that symbol in the same way that Jasper Johns wasn't done with the symbol of the American flag. And so he made a variety of different paintings that are all based on the Campbell Soup can. James Rosenquist appropriates the imagery from uh, appropriates his imagery from popular culture, but instead of actually collaging it 
or presenting it in a way that is a very obvious critique of that, like say Girl with Ball or Warhol's Soup Cans, he involves them in these much more abstract um, I don't know what the proper word to use here, actually, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. He takes images from popular culture and pieces them together so that we have this unified composition that is challenging to look at. You know, you can't quite figure out what you're looking at, you're trying to make sense of it, uh, you, it's all slowly coming into, uh, it, it takes a long time, it's, it's a slow process to really get this read down. Um, the one thing I will say, though, is that this is actually a square canvas up to this point here. Mm -hmm. So that's a straight line that actually runs all the way across a square canvas. It goes up and encompasses this, this whole thing. Right? But this down here is an add-on. So it's a slight shaping of the canvas. And that breaking of the rectilinear format that we've seen so many canvases take is Rosenquist's way of engaging a little bit more with the audience's idea of what the real world is. Like, had he cut off that line right here, we would not see fully that this glass is meant to feel as though it's sitting in real space, and it has real gravity, and is associated with our reality. Um, and so he adds this thing down here to help illuminate that. Here we have another image by Rosenquist. Um, here he differentiates where he's pulled source material from. So we have a man's legs here that are rendered only in a, um, a scale of red values, and then a female set of legs here that are rendered in a gray scale of values. He then attaches these two blue blocks on the top of the canvas that give some sort of indicator that you're looking at two things, like one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. Um, but then the landscape is very, it makes some semblance of sense, as do the shadows cast by these figures. So Rosenquist is really getting us to a point where there's an onslaught of information that we're seeing, and we're amassing all of it together at once. It all kind of jams together. Lee Lozano, I'm going to talk about her a little bit more next week when we deal more specifically with performance. Um, but here is a representational work where she deals with uh, her being a female artist in this very male-dominated world. Um, and so she's giving us a perspective of what it's like to be a woman in popular culture, where you, you don your red lipstick, you pluck your eyebrows, um, and you get ready for a night out. But there is a funny, very subtle allusion here to Minnie Mouse, in that the figure here is wearing gloves, yellow gloves, and those yellow gloves are, at this time, very, very recognizable as being of either Minnie or Mickey Mouse. Mel Ramos pulls his uh, source material directly from comic books. Um, he also does some things that pull directly from um, things like Playboy magazine or other gentlemen's magazines. And so here we have uh, this presentation of the Green Lantern in this kind of pink ethereal space. Um, but in other Mel Ramos works, there are buxom blonde ladies and all that other stuff. Ed Ruscha, um So at this point, we see, by 1963, we have the rise of the interstate system in the United States as put forth by Dwight Eisenhower. And so the idea of a roadside gas station becomes a cultural icon by the 1960s. The road trip, the, I mean, some of you might have heard of the book On the Road by Jack Kerouac. This idea that the American youth, you know, a youth that two generations prior and the immediate subsequent generation went to war these gener this generation has no war to fight yet. Vietnam hasn't really bubbled up yet. Um, and so, uh, and Korea, some of them fought in Korea, but not all of them. And so a lot of young men actually went on these vast road trips. And so where other artists are pulling from the things they see in the kind of ubiquitous images they see in advertising campaigns or in comic books, 
Boucher is saying there's this other series of images, like Jasper John's a little bit, there's this other series of images that we also pull, that we also see, that are also ubiquitous, that are also part of our culture. And so he makes paintings of them here, the gas station. This is one of Roy Lichtenstein's more famous works. It's called Wham! And it is taken, obviously, from a comic book, as some of you might uh, be able to tell. But he plays a lot with the shape of um, the planes in these instances, and he plays a lot with the perspective points. Like, obviously, the plane that is being uh, blown up here is very, very close to the plane that fired the, the missile in the perspective. Also, there's a great deal of foreshortening on the plane itself. Um, but all that aside, the manner in which this is rendered is taken almost exactly from the comic strip. He makes subtle changes where the changes need to be, but there is a very pointed social critique here about teaching us to glamorize warfare and uh, looking at who is taught specifically to glamorize warfare. It's not in little girls' magazines, it's only in the magazines of little boys. Rosalind Drexler, Love and Violence, uh, pulling a lot of cues from Piet Mondrian, not only with the palette of black, white, red, yellow, and blue specifically, but also tying in uh, popular culture by bringing in moments of, of movies, scenes from movies, where there are elements of both love and violence. So at the top of the frame, we have uh, an image that seems as though both this woman could be caressed in a loving way, but also domineered by the man who is touching her. So there is, in that top frame, both love and violence, or the idea of both. And in the bottom frame, we have scuffling gangsters. And the idea with gangsters, uh, for Drexler, you know, a gangster is a, f a family person. When you are in a mob, you are in a family, right? That's how we collectively understand the mafia. And so there is also this air of love and violence, where if you step out of line in one, you might get hit. Where you step out of line in the other, you might become a hit or get killed. Gerhard Richter uh, takes photographs that he finds, but also photographs that are his, and makes these paintings uh, that are kind of haunting but also that have very clear indications that they are from photographs that might not be complete. So we have a missing hand here. Uh, there's also the grainy black and white um, aspect to the figure uh, that is a clear line from the black and white photograph that this was taken from. Marjorie Strider, uh, striptic drip, triptych, excuse me, beach girl, number two. Obviously, I hope some of you guys can recognize that these are pulled from like pinup ads or like an ad campaign or a, a, a photo shoot with a model. Uh, Marjorie Strider, the thing I really like about this is she actually puts um, metal where the breasts of this model would be and then paints the image of the breast over them. And so she is saying, you know, I'm making up this very flat representation of a female but I'm giving you the breasts. I'm giving you the protrusion of the breasts. And she's doing that to say, you know, you're not actually looking at this woman's face. You're not looking at any other part of her body. The thing you're all focusing on, that we as a culture, women and men included, are focusing on this one aspect of her. And so even the original image that Strider is appropriating here is a flat representation of a woman in that we have no idea who she is, what she does, or anything. We are only looking at this image for um, what Strider offers us. George Segal uh, taps into what Capra brought up with the idea of the expanding sculptural field um, with th these kinds of works that are pulled directly from moments in real life. He sets up scenes, whether it be a park bench or a phone booth, that we recognize, that we as an audience have inhabited, but instead of allowing us the ability to sit down at this diner counter, he creates these molds of human forms made almost entirely in white plaster, 
and he sets them there. And so we are meant only to be the outsider in this very recognizable situation. And lastly, by 1965, we have moved so far away from the abstract gestures of the 1940s and the early 1950s that we have this work, which is a screen print of a brush stroke. So the brush stroke that defined the practice for Jackson Pollock, that was translated into a performative practice in Paris with Georges Mathieu, has uh, that, that was also used by Robert Rauschenberg to critique abstract painting is here used in a, in, in a print. And the interesting thing about it being a print, you know, with an abstract gesture in a Jackson Pollock painting, they're impossible to repeat. I've talked to people who have conserved Jackson Pollock's works, um, and they have, in trying to rebuild certain aspects of the paintings that are lost, they've come to the understanding that Pollock was it is very, very, very difficult to remake a Jackson Pollock painting. This, however, is a screen print, which means you can make hundreds of these things, and thereby making, diminishing that primacy that we applied to the brushstroke uh, just one generation prior. And with that, a very long lecture comes to an end, and uh, Yes, ask me questions uh, about any of the assignments that I've opened, um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Take care.